the Portraits in Black History series was produced with the goal of publishing the many positive contributions made to American and world society by people of African descent to challenge the many negative stereotypes that daily bombard us and to celebrate the accomplishments of a people who rose up from slavery to national and world leadership. As you listen to the records of the lives of some of the people being portrayed, you will hear some accounts of racial oppression and brutality. This information may make some listeners uncomfortable, but it is the historical context that frame the lives of the characters being portrayed. To remove the characters from their real life context would be intellectually dishonest and would diminish the accomplishments of these heroes being portrayed. Imagine celebrating the skills, endurance, and accomplishments of Muhammad Ali without juxtaposing him against smoking Joe Frazier or the towering George Foreman. The hero is measured by the power and determination of the opponent. With this in mind, our characters are portrayed within the context of the times in which they live. And now, we present a portrait in black history. The Life of Barack Obama, written by Latoya Black, edited by Kenneth E. Sullivan, Ph.D., copyright 2010, by Merge Curriculum Publishing, LLC, read by Kenneth E. Sullivan, Ph.D. And now, The Life of Barack Obama. The 1950s and 60s was a point of destiny in the annals of American history. The struggle of generations of African Americans against racial oppression was culminating in the body of events that would change the nation. Early anti-slavery and civil rights activists like Frederick Douglass, Mary MacLeod Bethune, and Harriet Tubman had devoted their entire lives to the quest of moving America to live up to its promise of liberty and justice for all its citizens. They made measurable gains, but were often disappointed when some of the ground they had fought so hard to gain was lost again. However, their indomitable spirits compelled them to fight on. These early freedom fighters were the pioneers who blazed a trail for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s that began to reshape America. A series of events that would finally result in a new nation were set in motion by a brilliant young attorney named Thurgood Marshall. Marshall, an attorney for the NAACP, argued before the United States Supreme Court that segregated public schools were unconstitutional because they denied black children equal educational opportunities. He further argued that segregated black schools were inherently inferior and did irreparable harm to African-American children. On May 17, 1954, by unanimous decision, the court ruled in Marshall's favor. This decision declared that racial segregation was a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. This was a landmark victory because it paved the way for the modern civil rights movement and made the goal of integration in all facets of American society obtainable. As a result of the Brown decision, color barriers gradually began to break down in the area of education. The University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill admitted three African-American students in 1955 amid a great deal of protest from rabid segregationists. In 1957, a group of African-American students referred to as the Little Rock Nine enrolled in Little Rock Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, and set off a firestorm of angry protests, which initially prevented the students from entering the school. In support of staunch segregationists, Governor Orville Faubus called out the Arkansas National Guard to block the entrance of the school and prevent the students from entering. President Eisenhower was compelled to intervene by sending in federal troops and taking control of the National Guard from Governor Faubus. On September 25, 1957, under the watchful eye of the U.S. 101st Airborne Division, the Little Rock Nine were permitted to enter the school. On November 14, 1960, the parents of six-year-old Ruby Bridges enrolled her in William France Elementary School amid jeers and taunts from a large crowd of angry whites. With the exception of one teacher, all the teachers refused to teach as long as Ruby was enrolled. Upon her entrance into the school, the white parents removed their children, refusing to allow them to share the same school with a little black child. However, 
a number of white families were appalled at the conduct of the white mobs and offered their assistance to the Bridges family, who suffered the loss of employment in retaliation for sending Ruby to France Elementary School. In 1961, Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes endured continuous racial taunts and chilling death threats as they integrated the University of Georgia. Their presence in the university set off race riots. Integration came at an extremely high price for African-American students who risked their very lives and suffered continuous humiliation to attend historically segregated schools. Still, less than 1% of black children attended integrated public schools in the South. Many of the Northern schools were also segregated, not by force of law, but by de facto segregation, which resulted from the economic disparities between blacks and whites and racial discrimination which existed in housing. In the year following the Brown decision, on December 1, 1955, a young seamstress named Rosa Parks challenged the Jim Crow law of segregation on public transportation by refusing to give up her seat to a white man, and the Montgomery bus boycott began. The boycott, which lasted 381 days, was the catalyst that ushered a 26-year-old Morehouse College graduate named Martin Luther King, Jr., to the forefront of the civil rights movement and onto the world stage. The Montgomery boycott was successful, not only in bringing an end to segregated seating on Montgomery buses, but in galvanizing a movement which would spread all across the South, demanding an end to segregation and racial discrimination. African Americans, whites, and other ethnic groups from all over the country were emboldened to join peaceful protests and demonstrations that took the form of boycotts, marches, wait-ins, sit-ins, and freedom rides. Civic and student-run organizations were active in aiding in the fight for freedom. Young and old joined together and served in organizations like the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Congress on Racial Equality. Freedom Riders organized public integrated bus trips through the Deep South to determine if the new court order banning segregated seating on interstate bus terminals would be enforced. On May 14, 1961, a bus containing a group of Freedom Riders was attacked in the bus terminal at Anniston, Alabama by a mob welding clubs and bats. The mob broke windows, slashed the tires, and pursued the bus several miles out of town until it was forced to stop. In the absence of any police presence, a man from the mob firebombed the bus and the escaping passengers were brutally beaten until the police finally arrived to quell the violence. A number of the Freedom Riders were seriously injured. In some cases, the police were complicit with the mobs in their attacks on the Freedom Riders. But despite the threat, blacks and whites from all across the country continued to volunteer to join the Freedom Rides that took them directly into hostile southern territory. In the spring of 1963, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led a campaign of peaceful protests in Birmingham, Alabama, to seek an end to segregation and jobs discrimination. The campaign employed the use of sit-ins at segregated lunch counters and other segregated public facilities, as well as a series of marches. As the world watched by television, the Birmingham Police Department, led by Eugene Bull Connor, launched an unprovoked attack against the marchers. From his television set in the Oval Office, President John F. Kennedy watched in shock and disbelief with the rest of the world as the Alabama police and fire department set dogs and fire hoses upon the helpless men, women, and children. Kennedy had tried to steer clear of the issue of civil rights for African Americans because it was politically unpopular to support it. He needed the support of the Southern white Democrats who were violently opposed to any kind of civil rights legislation. So he, like Abraham Lincoln 100 years before him, sought to appease the Southerners by stalling civil rights for African Americans. But despite Kennedy's call for patience on the part of Reverend King and other black leaders, they pushed ahead demanding full citizenship rights immediately. On August 28, 1963, King led the historic March on Washington, demanding jobs and the end of discrimination in America. Before a crowd of more than 250,000 people, he delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech and electrified the audience. After witnessing firsthand the violence and gross injustices against African-American citizens, 
President Kennedy began to speak out on their behalf and to advocate for justice and equality for all of Americans. However, in November 1963, Kennedy was slain in Dallas, Texas by an assassin's bullet shortly after his arrival there. But his successor, President Lyndon B. Johnson, took up the cause of civil rights in Kennedy's memory and honor by signing the landmark Civil Rights Act into law in 1964 and following up with the National Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Civil Rights Act was another guarantee for equal rights for African Americans, while the Voting Rights Act prohibited discriminatory voting practices that had disenfranchised African Americans since the end of Reconstruction. But change would not be immediate. Jim Crow laws had stood firm in the southern states for nearly a hundred years because blacks had been shut out of the political arena since the end of Reconstruction, following the Civil War. In states like Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana, nearly 90% of blacks had been excluded from the political process and kept out of political office. Discriminatory laws such as grandfather clauses, poll taxes, and literacy tests were put in place to prevent them from voting. Blacks who attempted to vote were also subject to violence and intimidation. These outrageous practices kept a large percentage of blacks paralyzed with fear and relatively few were willing to risk their lives and livelihood to cast their vote. The situation in the northern states was only slightly better than the South, politically. Only a few African Americans served as state legislators and city councilmen. By 1960, four African Americans served in the House of Representatives, which consisted of 435 white members. Adam Clayton Powell Jr., a Democrat from New York, was the only African American within the House to chair a major committee when he was elected to head the Education and Labor Committee. In the fall of 1961, James B. Carson of Chicago became the nation's second African American federal judge and Wade McCree of Detroit its third. Although blacks continued to advance in nearly every professional capacity in American society, the rate of progress was slow. The new civil rights legislation was designed to address this problem, but it would require the continued agitation of African Americans and their white allies to bring about real and lasting change. While the struggle for racial equality was taking place in the lower 48 states, a young white woman from Kansas was giving birth to a baby boy in a Hawaiian hospital. Barack Hussein Obama II was born in Honolulu, Hawaii on Friday, August 4, 1961. He was born the child of Barack Obama Sr. and Stanley Ann Dunham. Barack's parents were an unlikely pair. He was an East African on a foreign exchange scholarship. She was a shy but friendly Kansas-born white woman. They met at the University of Hawaii in a Russian language class and were drawn to each other. Barack Sr. was of Kenyan descent and belonged to the Luo tribe. He was born in a village called Alego near Lake Victoria. As a boy, he tended to his father's goats. After entering school, Barack Sr. was immediately noticed for his quick grasp of the materials he studied. He rose to first place in his class, and because of his intellectual capacity, he soon became bored with school because of the lack of challenge the material presented to him. Being aware of his son's ability and wanting him to receive a better education, Barack Sr.'s father, Hussein Onyango Obama, sent him away some 50 miles from their home to attend a mission school. Although Barack Sr. was academically astute, he was also mischievous and rebellious throughout his youth. His attitude eventually led to his expulsion from the mission school. Although Barack Sr. feared and respected his father, his irresponsible behavior created a rift between them. The rift became wider after he quit a job as a clerk that his father had gotten for him. He stormed out in anger after a heated argument with his employer. Barack Sr.'s defiant attitude and disposition greatly angered and disappointed his father. A series of dead-end jobs and arrests for participation in political meetings further strained the father-son relationship and left him estranged from his father for a long period of time. When Barack Sr. was 20 years old, he met and fell in love with a young woman from Kenya. After a brief courtship, they married and had two children, a son and daughter. But his lack of employment and subsequent lack of finances put a serious strain on the marriage. 
In desperation, he went to his father for help, but was harshly rejected. His father had become ashamed and disappointed with the irresponsible behavior Barack Sr. had demonstrated for most of his life. Just when he was about to resign himself to his disappointing situation, a golden opportunity presented itself. In the late 1950s, Barack Sr. met two American women who taught in Nairobi. When they saw his potential, the two suggested that he further his education at a university in the United States. However, he had no means to pay tuition and could hardly support his family. There was also the fact that he did not have a secondary school certificate, the equivalent of a high school diploma. But his newfound associates encouraged him to take correspondence courses to earn the certificate he needed. He followed their advice and after months of study, passed the exam and received the certificate. Immediately, Barack Sr. began to write to American universities in pursuit of a scholarship. The University of Hawaii responded and offered him a full scholarship. His heart leaped with excitement upon receiving the news, and he began to dream of the possibility that would open up for him and what life would be like in America. When Barack Sr. shared the news with his father, he was overjoyed and encouraged his son to be diligent and to fully commit himself to his studies. Although his father could not offer financial assistance, he offered a great deal of encouragement and moral support. He felt a great sense of pride over his son's move to redeem himself from the errors of his past. By taking the initiative to pursue an education in America, Barack Sr. had placed himself in his father's good graces. In 1959, he said goodbye to his pregnant wife and his children and left Nairobi, bound for America. The 23-year-old Kenyon was the first African student admitted to the University of Hawaii where he would later graduate with a degree in econometrics. Barack Obama's mother was very shy, but possessed a cheerful demeanor. Although her first name was actually Stanley, a boy's name, she naturally preferred to be called Anne by her friends and family. Her father had picked out the name Stanley with the hopes that she would be a boy and decided to keep the name despite her gender. Anne was born in Wichita, Kansas, but the family later lived in Oklahoma, Texas, California, Kansas, Washington, and Hawaii. Ann's father worked as the manager of a furniture store and later became a furniture salesman. Her mother, Madeline Dunham, was a homemaker, but she later became a bank manager. As an only child, Ann spent most of her after-school hours reading. She immersed herself in many different kinds of books and simply loved to go on long walks. She was a very bright girl and an excellent student. Because she was alone a great deal of the time, and due to her shyness, Anne was lacking in the area of social skills. She struggled to fit in with other children her age and felt awkward in social settings. However, her shy demeanor did not prevent her from making a few friends. Through the countless books she read, she learned about people of various cultures and found each culture interesting. Her imaginary foreign travels created a strong desire to actually travel to many of the exotic places she read about. She would someday live among different interesting people, experience their cultures, and learn their customs. When she was 10 years old, Anne developed a friendship with a black girl at her Texas school. One day, the two girls decided to play in Anne's front yard. When white onlookers noticed them, they demonstrated their disapproval. Both girls were subjected to racial epitaphs and taunts and were even pelted with rocks from classmates and neighbors. When Anne's mother came home to discover what had occurred, she was concerned for Anne and her friend's safety. She and her husband confronted the principal of the predominantly white school and lodged their complaints and concerns for their daughter, only to be told that white children do not play with black children in their community. Anne's parents were outraged and saddened by the principal's callous racist attitude. They had taught their daughter to be accepting of people of all races. By the time Anne was in her teens, she had developed a progressive, nonconformist attitude. Although she grew up in a decade where many whites expressed hatred and discrimination toward blacks, she decided, with the help of her parents, to take a different path, one of love and acceptance. She took a positive attitude toward people and tried to see the good in them. She was sensitive to the needs of others, an attitude her son would later describe as a loving and naive disposition. In the late 1950s, Anne and her parents moved from Texas to Seattle, Washington. 
As she prepared to graduate from high school, she began exploring the possibility of continuing her studies in another part of the country. After she expressed her desire to pursue a degree at the University of Chicago, her father disapproved. He felt that she was too young to move by herself and live on her own. Following her high school graduation, her father moved the family to Hawaii in pursuit of better employment. At 18 years old, an enthusiastic Anne enrolled at the University of Hawaii. Although Hawaii was not foreign soil, its exotic nature satisfied a bit of the desire she carried from very early in her life to live among different people and cultures. Anne and Barack Sr. fell in love almost immediately after their first encounter. Excited and optimistic about their relationship, the young couple shared the news with their parents, only to be disappointed. Barack Sr.'s father was livid and threatened to revoke his son's student visa if he continued the courtship. He also reminded his son about his young wife and children back in Africa. These were details Barack Sr. had failed to divulge to Anne. His father ended the conversation by forbidding him to get mixed up with a white American woman. Anne's parents, though initially impressed with Barack Sr., expressed a lukewarm reaction, more concerned with the couple's safety in a society that was intolerant of interracial unions than Barack Sr.'s race. They were also accustomed to Anne's impulsive but determined personality and realized that there was nothing they could do or say to persuade her to end the relationship. The young couple dismissed their parents' reactions and went off to get married on the island of Maui. Understandably upset and concerned, both sets of parents believed the couple's decision to marry was a bad one. Interracial marriages were deeply frowned upon during this time in American history and society. The parents knew that the young couple would be subjected to all kinds of harsh and humiliating treatment, which would introduce undue pressure into their relationship. In some states, their marriage was even considered a felony. The marriage was brief, and the divorce was quick. Anne was left to raise young Barack Obama alone. Despite the deep pain and disappointment from the failed marriage and the broken promises from Barack Sr., she was determined to go on with her life and provide the best life possible for her son. Barack Sr. continued his education. He was granted another scholarship, and upon graduating at the top of his class in 1963, he moved to Boston, Massachusetts to pursue a Ph.D. at Harvard University. Barack Obama was two years old and would not see his father again for eight years. Lovingly known as Barry to his family and friends, young Barack was raised by his mother and grandparents, the Dunhams. Anne later began to travel frequently to foreign countries, and Barack's grandparents, whom he affectionately called Toots and Gramps, would accept much of the responsibility of raising him. Barack experienced a colorful childhood, full of sports and fun on the tropical beaches and backdrops of Hawaii. A few years after Barack's parents' divorce, his mother met and fell in love with Lolo Sotoro, an Indonesian student who also attended the University of Hawaii. In 1967, they married and all moved to Jakarta, Indonesia. Soon after their arrival, Obama's half-sister Maya was born. During his four years in Indonesia, Barack attended Catholic and Muslim schools. Although he never converted to either religion, he learned the different customs and teachings of the culture, ate ethnic foods, and lived the life of a typical boy. Indonesia was underdeveloped and poverty-stricken a vast contrast of what he was accustomed to in Hawaii. But his mother taught him to maintain a healthy and fair attitude about all the people he encountered. Meanwhile, back in America, the world was shocked when it was reported that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. King had traveled to Memphis to support the grievances of black sanitation workers and to hold marches and rallies for poor people. On April 3, 1968, he spoke at a rally at Mason Temple Church of God in Christ the night before his assassination and delivered his famous mountaintop speech. He informed the crowd that he was not afraid. He spoke prophetically as he revealed a sense that his life on earth would soon come to an end. But he assured the people that, although he might not get there with them, we as a people would get to the promised land. A few hours later, on April 4, 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was dead. 
Riots broke out in cities all across America in response to the news, but after a few weeks of vented frustration, things gradually returned to normal. Barack and his family were a world away from what was happening in America, and the thing that most concerned his mother was Barack's education. She wanted him to have the best educational opportunity possible. However, she could not afford to send him to the international school. So she supplemented his common school education by providing him with English lessons for three hours each weekday morning before she headed off to work and sent him to school. Because he had the opportunity to live in several different places, Barack learned to appreciate the cultures and people who shaped his outlook and global attitude. So Toro and his mother eventually divorced, yet he credits his former stepfather with teaching him life lessons about manhood, family, and survival. In his book, Obama, From Promise to Power, David Mendel quoted Barack, I was raised as an Indonesian child and a Hawaiian child and as a black child and as a white child. And so what I benefited from is a multiplicity of cultures that all fed me. After her second divorce in 1971, Anne moved Barack and his sister back to Hawaii. They lived modestly in a small apartment with his grandparents nearby. For the remainder of his primary education, he attended a prestigious college preparatory school on the island called Panaho School. The private school was 90% white and almost 10% Asian, which made Barack and his noticeably brown skin stand out among his classmates. In December 1971, Barack got an unexpected surprise. Having only a vague memory of his father and a few letters that he'd written him over the years, Barack Sr. came to visit him for a month. Barack was both thrilled and guarded because up until the time he received a word of his father's visit, he knew very little about the man. His mother painted a picture of his father as a brilliant, confident, and strong man who demanded respect. His grandparents seemed to be impressed with his father's intellect more than anything and described him as charming and clever. But for Barack, his father remained more of a myth than a human being. To fill the gaps in his knowledge about his father and to address the occasional questions from curious schoolmates, Barack made up stories about him. He told his friends that his father was prince of a royal kingdom in Africa and that his grandfather was a very important and respected king of his village. To prepare for his father's visit, his mother educated him on Kenya's culture and history. Barack also took the initiative to learn more about his father's native land through a trip to the library. On a Saturday afternoon, Barack visited a local library and studied a book on Kenya and the Luo tribe. To his dismay, his father's tribe and homeland were not what he had hoped or fantasized about. He was disappointed to discover that the Luo were poor people who herded goats for a living. They lived in mud huts, raised cattle, and ate cornmeal. He was also surprised to learn that they wore only a piece of leather to conceal the area of the crotch. Barack saw their dress as well as their way of life as primitive and peculiar. He was devastated and somewhat embarrassed by these facts. During Barack Sr.'s visit, Barack studied him and began to secretly mimic his mannerisms. His father appeared to be very sharp and charismatic, and Barack believed he was genuinely happy to have him as a son. His father congratulated him on being a good student, and spoke to his fifth grade class at the request of his teacher, who was also Kenyan. During one special time, Barack Sr. taught him how to dance and encouraged him to listen to African music. Barack, who had developed a love of basketball years before his father's visit, was even presented with his very own basketball from his father, which he grew to cherish. Yet, in the short month he spent around Barack Sr., he was too afraid to ask questions that had plagued him for years. On one particular evening, after completing his homework, Barack sat in his grandparents' living room to watch a classic Christmas movie. Barack Sr. became infuriated and scolded him in front of his mother and grandparents for what he believed to be too much television and not enough study. Hurt and confused, Barack came to realize that his father was obsessed with education and good work ethics. Much later in a 2003 interview, Barack shared his mixed sentiments about his childhood experience. My father's absence in my life, it was just so complicated. He was a brilliant guy, but in so many ways, his life was a mess. 
children by different women, a political career that turned in on itself. Every man is trying to live up to his father's expectations or make up for his mistakes. In my case, both things might be true. By the time Obama started high school, he had already assimilated back into American culture. His mother and sister returned to Indonesia and had decided to study in Java to pursue another master's degree. During her absence, Barack began to reflect upon his own racial identity. He became consumed with unanswered questions about his heritage, the short marriage of his parents, and his family history. He noticed how black men were treated and stereotyped in America. He also experienced a degree of racism and heard blacks referred to in derogatory terms. Barack began to realize that he was different from his mostly white friends. Although his friends thought of him as popular and outgoing and his grandparents saw no signs of trouble, he bordered on depression as he contemplated his racial identity. He released many of these frustrations on the basketball court. During this time in his life, he also began to experiment with marijuana and alcohol. Eventually, his grades began to slip, and he developed a nonchalant attitude toward his education and life in general. When his mother's work permitted her to move back to Hawaii, she noticed a change in her son and was saddened. She refused to listen to any of his excuses, but she was sympathetic to his concerns. Although she did not know how to truly explain his father's absence or answer his questions about his identity, she did all she could to support him. She encouraged him to begin thinking and acting more positively and responsibly and to set goals and dreams for himself. She also stressed the importance of a good education and the opportunities that would exist for him if he applied himself. She gave him a pep talk, emphasizing that he could do or be anything he wanted to as long as he studied and worked hard. His mother was a single, constant parent in his life, and Barack did not want to disappoint her. Like his parents before him, Barack proved to be an exceptionally bright student. After the pep talk from his mother, he improved his grades and began to consider his future. He realized that he needed to do something with his life, but was uncertain of what it was or where he would go. However, he was sure of one thing, he wanted to leave Hawaii and experience the outside world. In 1979, he graduated high school with honors. He had received acceptance letters from a number of schools, but chose to attend Occidental College in Los Angeles because of a friend he had met from there. As he made friends with other black students, his questions about his own identity began to resurface. He was absolutely fascinated with the different students of color he encountered in Los Angeles, and he secretly envied their stories. But he also saw some of himself and his struggles in the black students he got to know. He surrounded himself with black friends in hopes to better understand what it meant to be black and to gain better knowledge of his culture. He desperately wanted to fit in and be understood, but his rather shy nature made it a bit difficult for him. However, he was very easy to get along with, and soon his friends encouraged him to confront and deal with his issues. It was also at this point in his life that he decided to cast off the name Barry, which he had carried from childhood, and embrace his Arabic name, Barak, which means blessed. Barak's political interest was sparked during his freshman year when he began helping to plan political meetings in protest. He became an avid reader of historical and political books and literature. During his sophomore year, he became involved with a South African divestment campaign and gave his first speech to a crowd of passionate students on the campus at a rally against apartheid. Although he did not get to deliver the full message, his black friends and the crowd were very impressed. He realized he had made a connection with the people, something he had never been able to do before. His voice, opinions, and thoughts had been heard and well received. Barack discovered that he possessed the seeds of oratory skills, but knew his potential had to be developed. The freedom and temptations of campus life proved to be a distraction for Barack. By his sophomore year, he was engaged in excessive partying, drinking, and drugs. But he regained his focus and, despite some of the negative influences around him, was able to redirect his energies to the pursuit of his educational goals. Later, he began to consider a transfer program that would allow him to complete his degree in political science. He needed a change. At age 20, he left California and headed east for New York to finish his undergraduate studies at Columbia University.
During his time in New York, he purposely withdrew himself from peers and lived a reclusive lifestyle. Aside from random excursions around the city of Manhattan and ventures into boroughs such as Harlem and Brooklyn, Barack was solely focused on his studies. He immersed himself in the ideologies of famous philosophers and humanitarians. Because New York was such an expensive place to live, he got a job at a construction site to make ends meet. To stay fit and to clear his mind, he ran three miles a day and even fasted on Sundays. It was also during this time that he began to keep a journal of his thoughts. He wrote in his journal every day and even tried his hand at poetry. These journal entries would later become a large part of his memoirs, Dreams from My Father. Barack's roommate, an outgoing Pakistani named Sadiq, believed he was a bore and tried to get him to loosen up. But when he felt their conversation was hitting too close to his personal issues, Barack would immediately withdraw. He was still haunted by questions about his father. He recalled memories of their last days together and would sometimes begin writing letters to his father but never finished them. However, throughout his journey of self-discovery and reflection, he maintained close communication with his mother and grandparents. Barack never had the opportunity to really get to know his father because a year before settling in New York, he received a phone call from his Aunt Jane of Nairobi, Kenya. This call was both an introduction to his father's side of the family as well as a harbinger of bad news. Aunt Jane shared the news of his father's tragic death. Barack Sr. died in 1982 in a car accident. Barack was just 21 years old. The news was something of a shock to him, but it was not accompanied by any deep emotions. It took a few minutes to process his father's death and the information about the funeral arrangements. In his memoir, Barack disclosed the fact that he never shed a tear over his father's death when he got word and sat emotionless on his sofa, only to be interrupted by the smell of burnt eggs from his kitchen. Instead of going to the funeral, he wrote a letter to his father's family and expressed his condolences. In 1983, Barack graduated from Columbia University with a bachelor's degree in political science. He also knew for the first time in his life exactly what career he wanted to pursue, community activism. His friends were skeptical of his sudden epiphany and ridiculed him for the thought of rejecting a higher salaried corporate job. Barack understood their skepticism as it was an uncommon career track, but his mind was made up and he pressed on toward his dream. After being turned down from several civil rights organizations across the nation, he finally accepted a job as a research assistant at a consulting firm called Business International Corporation. His performance was nothing short of spectacular and within months he was promoted to financial writer. The new job helped to keep money in his bank account and pay off his student loans but he was still thirsty for a challenge. He knew he wanted to do more and help people in a bigger way. After nearly two years, he resigned from the consulting job and began another tedious job search. This time, he got an offer in the Midwest. In 1985, he accepted a position as a community organizer in Chicago. His salary was only $10,000 with a $2,000 travel allowance. Barack fell in love with Chicago immediately. For three years, he drove to countless meetings around the city in a beat-up Honda Civic with a large hole through its floor. In order to truly experience the needs of his South Side Chicago neighbors, he took to the streets. He knocked on doors and organized meetings in various community settings, such as church basements, school cafeterias, and even street corners. He networked with important civic and political leaders in the city and initiated major projects like the Developing Community Project. He also worked tirelessly to help out with numerous voter registration drives and workshops. Barack was finally living his dream. To stay spiritually grounded, he became a member of Trinity United Church of Christ, where the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, a friend and mentor, was pastor. At last, he found a home away from home. But he grew restless with the activism work. He knew he could help the citizens much more if he had a better grasp of politics. Still full of energy and spirit, he decided to apply to Harvard Law School and was accepted in February 1988. But before moving to Boston, he felt compelled to take a trip to Africa. Barack had been corresponding with his half-sister, Alma, after the death of their father. When Alma moved back to Kenya after finishing her studies in Germany, 
Barack took advantage of the opportunity to meet her, along with his other half-siblings and the rest of his father's family. He arrived in Kenya in the summer of 1988. Alma greeted him with a warm smile and a big hug. She also served as hostess of his month-long visit. Alma shared stories of Barack Sr.'s career and personal life, careful to include all the details, good and bad alike. Barack learned that his siblings had also been abandoned or estranged from Barack Sr. during their childhood. He sat attentively and listened to the colorful and often sad oral history of his father's family as it was conveyed by his stepmother, Granny. After being united with his African family, Barack better understood his father and his legacy. He felt a sense of closure and forgave his father as he believed Barack Sr. tried to be the best man he could be in spite of his personal struggles. At his father's grave, he wept for the first and last time. The trip proved to be extremely important to Barack. He had never felt fully aware of who he was and had never known his African heritage. In the fall of 1988, Barack enrolled at Harvard Law School. He was just 27 years old, but a lot older than most of his classmates who had just completed their college degrees. Much like his days at Columbia University, Barack lived a fairly quiet life. He spent long hours in the libraries where he studied law and dug deep to understand policies and find solutions to problems that plague society. He also chose to live in a modest basement apartment in a working class, diverse neighborhood instead of living on campus. During his first year at Harvard, Barack's interest in politics and civil issues continued to grow. He served as a writer and editor of the Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review. He even loaned his talents to an expert Harvard Law professor by serving as a research and analytical assistant on a widely regarded article. He was known by his peers and professors as one of the sharpest and brightest law students. After his first year at Harvard Law, he moved back to Chicago to work as an intern at Sidney Austin Law Firm. Upon his arrival, he was assigned Michelle Robinson, a 1988 Harvard Law graduate and attorney, as his mentor. According to Barack, chemistry and attraction was immediate. The two quickly became friends outside their professional relationship and swapped stories of their joys and frustrations of law and politics. Although Michelle was impressed by her intelligent and charming mentee, she didn't think it would be appropriate to date him. But Barack continued to pursue her. He remained in close contact with Michelle throughout his time at Harvard Law. By his senior year, Barack was well-known and highly regarded on campus. He was elected president of the world-renowned Harvard Law Review, a very coveted and sought-after position. His fellow editors believed he was the person for the job and possessed a temperament and intellect to serve well. Barack was the first African-American to serve in the position in its history. In his new position, Barack openly expressed his strong and unapologetic views. He supported affirmative action and opposed apartheid. He even supported and spoke out on behalf of an African-American law professor, Derek A. Bell, who resigned and protested Harvard Law's poor recruiting and slow progress in granting tenure to its few minority professors at the time. In 1991, Barack graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. He passed up the opportunity to follow the financially rewarding career path that most of his colleagues chose and returned to Chicago as he had promised. Hoping to bring change to the city, he took a job as an associate civil rights attorney at Minor, Barnhill, and Galland, a major public interest law firm. The firm specialized in civil rights, employment discrimination, fair housing, and voting rights. He also continued his grassroots efforts and spearheaded numerous initiatives such as voter registration drives that gave people hope and a fighting chance. His work in Chicago and voter registration drives also helped to secure the 92 election for former Democratic President Bill Clinton and the election of Illinois U.S. Senator Carol Mosley Braun, the first African-American woman elected to the United States Senate. Shortly after his return to Chicago, Barack decided he wanted to teach. He believed that teaching would keep him on top of his game, and he wanted to help students better understand law. From 1993 to 2004, he taught constitutional law at the University of Chicago, where he instantly became widely received and loved by his students and colleagues. 
1992, he married his former mentor and close friend, Michelle Robinson. The wedding took place at Trinity United Church of Christ. His mother, sister, grandmother, and a host of family were in attendance, as well as several of his family members from Kenya. His grandfather, Stanley Dunham, had died of prostate cancer months before the wedding. After they were married, Barack and Michelle moved to a house in Hyde Park, an exclusive suburb of Chicago's South Side, where they lived throughout most of his political career. The young civil rights attorney and his career, once only known to the citizens of Chicago, began to blossom in the 90s. A series of achievements, both personal and professional, would follow Barack and bring him closer to achieving the change he sought for the people he represented. In 1993, he was named among Crane's Magazine's list of 40 Under 40 for his leadership in Chicago politics. His celebrated memoir, Dreams from My Father, a personal and intimate account of his life and search for identity, was also published. By 1996, he was elected to the Illinois State Senate as a Democrat of the 13th Legislative District. With that election, Barack was certain he was on his way to bringing solutions to his Southside Chicago neighbors. In 1998, he and wife Michelle welcomed their first daughter, Malia, followed by their second daughter, Natasha, known also as Sasha, in 2001. By 2002, Barack's political interests moved past Chicago and toward the nation's capital. He now felt ready to run for the U.S. Senate. The announcement came as no big surprise to friends and colleagues who had witnessed his determination and tireless activism in Chicago. During this time, America was recovering from the horrific events of 9-11. After the 9-11 attack, and against the will of some of the members of Congress, including Barack, former President George W. Bush immediately declared war on Iraq. In October 2002, Barack spoke out against the war in Iraq and Bush's administration because he believed they failed to provide sufficient evidence that Iraq was behind the 9-11 attack. Barack refused to go along with most of the Congress on this issue, and this caused critics to believe that he was too liberal and inexperienced to be a United States senator. Although Barack's name had become widely known in Illinois politics, he was virtually unknown to the rest of the political world. In early 2004, he won the primary election with 53% of the vote. This put him in the running for the U.S. Senate seat. His opponent, Alan Keyes, a Republican, was also African-American. On July 27, 2004, Obama delivered the keynote speech at the Democratic National Convention in Boston, Massachusetts. The 15-minute speech introduced the fresh-faced senator to the world in a dynamic way. He received thunderous applause and a standing ovation by the enthusiastic crowd of thousands. Republicans and Democrats alike soon paid closer attention to the man whose name no one seemed to pronounce correctly. Following the convention and a landslide victory over his opponent, Barack was declared winner and became the U.S. Senator from Illinois. His win made him the only African-American in Congress in 2004 and the fifth African-American to claim the title in its 109-year history. After winning the election, Barack released his memoirs to the world. The book has spent a year on the New York Times bestseller list in 1995 and would spend another year on the list in 2004. The book also introduced Obama to the general public in a bigger way now that he was a U.S. senator. On January 5, 2005, Barack was sworn into Congress in Washington, D.C. As with his previous work, he was committed to change, and immediately after the ceremony, he hit the ground running and began working on important legislation. After the devastation caused by Hurricane Katrina had left the city of New Orleans unrecognizable and its people homeless and destitute, Obama helped with recovery efforts on his own. He criticized the Bush administration for its poor response to the city and organized supporters to help in various recovery efforts. For the first two years as a U.S. senator, Barack traveled extensively around the globe with his BlackBerry close by to maintain regular communication with his wife and daughters. He traveled to the Middle East and discussed the violence that continued to erupt as a result of the war. He also visited African officials to work and try to resolve the AIDS epidemic that affected men, women, and children. Speculation surfaced about his interest in the presidency, but Barack never publicly confirmed or denied them during this time. 
his unforgettable speech at the 2004 Democratic National Convention, and his role as a U.S. Senator soon catapulted his career to new heights. During 2006 and 2007, he made numerous appearances on major talk, radio, and television news shows, but he remained humble and appreciative of the responsibilities given to him and took his job very seriously. For Barack, it was about serving the American people, and he believed they mattered most in the big scheme of things. In 2006, he released his second book, The Audacity of Hope, Thoughts on Reclaiming the American Dream. It was a huge success, and he received a Grammy for Best Spoken Word Album the same year. Readers, supporters, and critics alike were drawn to his passionate call for the restoration of a new America full of change and hope. The book also spent several weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. In the height of all the interviews and appearances, Barack began to consider running for the U.S. presidency. But he would not go forward with such a huge commitment without the support of the single most important person and biggest ally in his life, wife Michelle. Initially, Michelle was not sold on the idea that her husband should run for president. She believed he was highly qualified and very capable, but didn't know if she and her family wanted the public's watchful eye upon them. But by November 2006, Michelle was on board and Barack received her blessing. He began to prepare for the biggest challenge of his life. He also confirmed the announcement and made himself known in the world of cyberspace through his website. The rookie senator from Chicago was on his way. On February 10, 2007, in Springfield, Illinois, with his family nestled close by his side, Obama made the historic announcement that he would run for president. A crowd of nearly 10,000 waved and cheered in his support. Through his website and numerous speaking engagements around the heartlands and big cities of America, Obama shared the key initiatives that he would tackle if chosen. To end the war in Iraq, to end the spread of weapons of mass destruction, to rebuild alliances and partnerships dismantled by the Bush administration, to improve the nation's military, and to invest in the American people. His initiatives were accepted and received by the masses. Because he had skyrocketed to celebrity status by this time, Obama was also placed under Secret Service protection in May of 2007, which was unusually early for a presidential candidate. By 2008, Obama's run for president had swept the nation and caught the attention of the entire world. Several polls and news reports indicated that the American people were in favor of Barack Obama. However, some show that many people were still reluctant to elect an African-American as president. But Barack was full of hope and determination and did not let the polls bother him. He was a front runner on the Democratic ticket, along with another strong contender, Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. Senator Clinton was the former first lady and wife of former President Bill Clinton. If elected, she would become the first woman to serve in the presidency. Senator Clinton was a veteran politician with over 30 years of experience in public service and social welfare. But that did not stop Barack or discourage him from seeking the presidency. Throughout the many primaries that followed, he showed promise in the polls and received a great deal of buzz on the Internet. Obama's supporters transcended age, race, ethnicity, religion, sex, and socioeconomic background. They helped him exceed his campaign goals and contributed over $750 million in donations by the end of his campaign. Much of the campaign funds were contributed in small amounts of less than $50 each through online donations as a result of his user-friendly and frequently visited website. Obama mania, as media watchdogs coined it, had taken over the nation in cyberspace as well. A large percentage of his supporters were passionate college students, some of whom put their studies and lives on hold to help out with the campaign. They, along with others, canvassed and called thousands of Americans to spread Obama's message of hope and change and persuade critics to adopt the Yes We Can mantra. They viewed themselves just as committed to change as he was and wanted to see the American political infrastructure improve. Because the college students had a connection to young people and were technologically savvy, Obama became the most connected and wired presidential candidate to date. He updated his Twitter with important information and posted pictures and campaign tours to his Facebook page. 
the celebrity support that Obama received helped to secure his election and proved to be a major advantage to his campaign. Several well-known respected actors, actresses, and entertainers such as Tom and Katie Cruz, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kerry Washington, rapper-producer Will I Am, rock icon and activist Bono, and famous talk show host Oprah Winfrey were in full support of his quest for the presidency. Oprah, the queen of daytime talk and philanthropy, hosted several concerts in Chicago to help generate support for Obama. Yet, perhaps his biggest and most noteworthy endorsements came from veteran public officials. First, the late Edward Ted Kennedy, who was the longest sitting U.S. Senator and the brother of former President John F. Kennedy, endorsed Obama. Other members of the famous Kennedy family, whose names are synonymous with American politics, quickly followed, including Caroline Kennedy, daughter of JFK, and Maria Kennedy Shriver, niece of JFK, and wife of former actor-turned-California governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. By May 2008, General Colin Powell, a Republican who served as the first African-American Secretary of State under the Bush administration, publicly endorsed Barack during a television news interview on CNN. For Americans, and particularly African-Americans, Obama's bid for the White House seemed less surreal and more realistic than ever before. The flood of celebrity and political endorsements he received helped to solidify his shot at claiming the nomination. On June 3, 2008, a confident Barack clinched the Democratic nomination, making him the first African-American to ever lead a major party ticket. There, before a crowd of thousands of cheerful supporters in the Excel Energy Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, Barack delivered a heartfelt victory speech but also warned his supporters that the fight was not over. After the nomination, he continued to urge his supporters and the general public to buy into his dream of a new America. Over the summer months of 2008, his campaign team traveled through every major city in America. He spoke at universities, churches, and even major cultural events. Then on August 28, 2008, during the Democratic National Convention in Denver's In Vesco Field, Barack stood before nearly 84,000 supporters and accepted the nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. In the acceptance speech, he promised tax cuts for working class families, improved health care and its reform, and an end to the war in Iraq, which had claimed the lives of thousands of American soldiers and left hundreds more disabled, amputated, and without sufficient work or benefits. The speech came 45 years after the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his I Have a Dream speech. Senator Hillary Clinton was officially out, and the race for the White House was now between Barack Obama and Senator John McCain of Arizona. The two went toe-to-toe in countless town hall meetings and public debates throughout the remaining months of the campaign. In September 2008, as the general election drew closer, Barack and his campaign team surged ahead and conveyed their campaign message in print, online, and through the broadcast media. Hundreds of Americans, many of whom had never voted, registered to vote through the efforts of city and state Obama campaign office workers. McCain and Obama continued the campaign, each fending off attacks from the other and seeking the highest position in the polls. Unlike Obama, Senator McCain was a member of the U.S. military and had served in politics through three presidential administrations. The age difference of the two candidates was also clear. Obama, 47, and McCain, 73. In what appeared to some as an act of desperation, Senator McCain selected Sarah Palin, governor of Alaska, as his running mate. Palin's presence on the Republican ticket excited the Republican base, but did not reach outside to draw in independent voters, as McCain had gambled she would do. Her qualifications were widely questioned and contested, and controversies swirled around her personal family life. Just one day before Election Day 08, Barack was given the news of the passing of his grandmother, Madeline Toots Donham, who died in her Honolulu home. She was 86. Donham, who had been the rock of stability throughout his life, was already very ill at the time. Barack was deeply saddened over her passing. The American public poured out their condolences in support of the presidential hopeful and his family through millions of emails, cards, and YouTube videos. 
but the bitterness of his grief gave way to the sweetness of victory. On Wednesday, November 4, 2008, Barack Hussein Obama Jr. was declared the 44th president-elect of the United States of America. A number of the traditional red states of the Republican Party, like Indiana and South Carolina, had turned blue in support of the Democratic candidate who had exhibited the audacity of hope. Major news stations such as CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC captured the emotions of millions of people across the nation and throughout the continent as they shed tears of joy, happiness, and disbelief that change had finally come to America. Barack, who appeared cool yet humble, delivered his acceptance speech to a crowd of more than 60,000 who stood with smiles in frigid weather in Chicago's Grant Park. The newly declared president-elect promised that America's journey toward the change he had talked so frequently about throughout his campaign would not happen overnight. However, he encouraged his supporters in Grant Park and around the nation that true change would indeed come through the collective efforts of people who were united to bring it about. For African Americans, the moment symbolized what generations before them had worked, struggled, and died for. However, it is important to note that Barack Obama's victory was not just a victory for African Americans. It was a victory for all Americans. It is a measure of the distance the nation has traveled in the direction of its stated ideals that all men are created equal, and in its promise of liberty and justice for all. On January 20, 2009, Barack Hussein Obama was sworn in as the 44th President of the United States of America. Hundreds of thousands of people of all races from all over the world flooded the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to witness this example of hope fulfilled. In anticipation of this historical inauguration, many people camped out overnight in the freezing cold or set up tents and proudly wore Obama paraphernalia. The entire ceremony and the activities surrounding it lasted for more than four hours. Legendary soul singer Aretha Franklin belted out America the Beautiful, while other invited guests read inspirational poems and gave tribute to the day and the man as symphonic music filled the air. Cyberspace was alive with activity as thousands searched and viewed online updates and read tweets from members of Facebook and Twitter. Many respected political and civil rights figures were present to share in the inaugural festivities, such as former President Jimmy Carter, former President Bill Clinton, Representative John Lewis of Georgia, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Reverend Al Sharpton, and Reverend Joseph Lowry. One of the most memorable moments of the day was when the daughters of the president-elect, Malia and Sasha, were viewed by the nation as they watched their father take the oath of office to become the most powerful man in the world. Michelle beamed with pride and adoration at the side of her husband, who stood strong, tall, and confident before Chief Justice John Roberts with his hand on the Bible as he repeated the oath that confirmed him as the President of the United States of America. Barack Obama's election as the nation's 44th president is unarguably one of the most celebrated moments in African-American history. His professional and personal successes has come as the result of hard work, determination, commitment, and the support of the millions of people who share his dream of a better America. President Obama is the tree from a seed that was planted by our African-American ancestors who, despite centuries of bondage and brutality, continued to rise. Preceding generations of African-Americans endured and resisted slavery and subsequent second-class citizenship in their quest to transform America into a just nation. The journey from slave cabins to the White House has been a long and arduous one. As we take pride in this symbol of a nation which has moved closer to maturity, it is important to remember that Barack Obama was able to accomplish what he accomplished only by standing on the shoulders of giants. Bibliography Final Fundraising Figure Obama's $750 million by Taman Bradley ABC News Politics December 5, 2008 Hopes and Dreams the Story of Barack Obama by Steve Darty, Black Dog and Leventhal Publishers, 2009. Freedom Rise by Susan Eckelman, Encyclopedia of Alabama, July 24, 2008. Obama From Promise to Power by David Mendel, Harper Collins Publishers, 2010. Barack Obama 
a pocket biography of our 44th president by Stephen Niven, Oxford University Press, 2009. Dreams from My Father by Barack Obama, Three Rivers Press, 1995. Barack Obama, a biography by Joanne F. Price, Greenwood Press, 2008. Martin King, Jr., from Wikipedia, January 2010, Wikimedia Foundation, Inc. The Voting Rights Act, from Wikipedia, January 2010, Wikimedia Foundation, Inc.